Mugshart International presents Fresh Talk, conversations about creativity in the 21st century. I'm Kathy Bird, Fresh Art producer. In this Fresh Talk feature, we meet Chicago-based artist Theaster Gates. Theaster has developed an expanded artistic practice that includes space development, object making, performance, and critical engagement with many publics. His studies of sculpture, clay, and urban planning have given him keen awareness of the poetics of production and systems of organizing. The Astor's recent exhibition and performance venues include the Seattle Art Museum, Art Basel Miami Beach, Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, Milwaukee Art Museum, Contemporary Arts Museum Houston, and the Whitney Biennial and Armory Show in New York. The Astor was a participating artist in Documenta 13 in Kassel, Germany, with his 12 ballads for Huguenot House. He is currently exhibiting My Labor is My Protest at White Cube in London. Hello, everyone. Good to see friends out there. I'm Kathy Bird. Fresh Art producer, and tonight we are producing our first live podcast for Fresh Art International. And I'm really excited to have an audience for this. We are very fortunate to be here with the Aster and to be part of this second annual Kinetic Lecture Series. Thank you, Daryl and Zoe and those who participated. And the Astor and I are joined here tonight by some students, and they are Wilmer Wilson, an alum of Howard, Sidney Mullis, a student at University of Mary Washington, Emily Francisco, who is a current student here at American University, Heather Ravenscroft, who's also a student here at American. And we have some questions for the Astor and uh, we look forward to this conversation. Your practice, as I've been following it, very fortunate to visit both Dorchester Project in Chicago and Huguenot House in Castle this summer, or this fall, is very centered on urban spaces that are often seen as blighted or uh, totally abandoned of disinterest to many people. I'm very interested in how you seem to communicate with the history of the people that inhabited that space and how you seem to um, are, are motivated to work in this context and derive from it your content. Mm. Could you talk about that? Sure. Um, I, I think that um, one of the challenges that um, one of the challenges I have, and I've noticed that many of my colleagues who, who are from, from places, who, who rise out of places, is that um, when you gain access to other places, it's hard to let go of the luggage of the place that you're from. Some of my colleagues don't have this. They're happy when they leave their parents. They're happy to leave their suburb. They're happy that the familial tie is a loose one. I don't have that luxury. And so I think that I've always had the burden of trying to at the same time make meaning through making or whatever and um, make and reconcile that, that there's both meaning making and reconciliation of these worlds that I live between. And so I think that the, the thing that seems like blight or abandonment or, 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 or the ills of the city, it's just where I'm from. And that I, I don't think about it like, I'm gonna go work in a poor community. I think um, I'm burdened by the lack of resource in this place where I grew up or this place reminds me of this other place where I grew up and I'm burdened by its lack of cultural resource. And so I only have two tricks, you know, maybe, maybe three, two and a half, two. I don't only have a couple tricks. 
And so I think I'm always just trying to bring my tricks with me um, while I'm, uh, and, and my tricks are always attempting to make meaning and, and reconcile access, the access that I have, the lack of access other people have. And stuff like that. So, so it, it happens that it's uh, often the hood but what was great about Documenta was that it was not my hood. It had nothing to do with hood, but there was still a kind of chasm. Uh, there was still, uh, culture comes every five years. How horrible for a place that, that, uh, that the deprivation have these oasis-like moments that you can time where things become vibrant and then they go dead again. So I was really interested in like, how do you ask the question about the possibility of culture living beyond the moment where culture is giving platform, is given platform. So I think Documenta allowed me to uh, really flex that it's not really about, it's not just about poor black places, it's about how one burdens. And, it, and I think I have a burden uh, like when, when I go to a place and there's no place to kick it, like I go to Oklahoma and there's no club, or I, you know, I go to the North St. Louis and I wanna, I wanna eat some good food and ain't none, it makes me want for food to be in North St. Louis. And so I'm just carrying my burdens where I go. And if somebody asks me to do something in Oklahoma and it ain't no club and I wanna kick it, I'm gonna build a fucking club. And so, so it's, it's that, that, that way of um, enacting and, and um, just really taking the, respond, the burden on yourself, you know? Just. And so that idea of labor as protest feeds into what you decide to do for each project in each context in which you're invited to work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for anybody I didn't have success asking permission, asking for political favors or aldermanic help, or um, uh, I, did, I, I didn't have access to the black elite or the white elite. It's only now that I have access to the black elite because of the Jewish elite. And so the, the, the opportunities are just now being created, you know. The, um, so in, a, in advance of that, I just had, um, I could either petition or protest or do the thing that I wanted. And both would require equal energy. So it's like, well, I'd rather just try to do the thing than, because I already know I'm wasting energy, not trying, at least if I try to do the thing. Like, I get stronger. If I'm, if I'm running around the stage, I might actually, you know, not be so uh, uh, short-winded. If I keep running around the stage. So it's like, well, at least I'll try to be weird and maybe I'll get healthy if I did this every day. I could, maybe I wouldn't be short of breath anymore. Heather? Um, in your performance, you mentioned, you know, like your, your way of building that fire truck um, piece mm. in kind of like a loose way. But when you actually mine for um, materials, in these locations, do you have a preconception of what you're gonna make, or mm. do you let the material inform you? Right. The materials that you mine are like old pieces of scrap wood, and like old windows and doors, and fabric, and paint, and you make things. You know, you make vitrines, and you put them in, and you use your materials, your upcycling, you're, you know, you're an environmentalist. Um, that I think that, that, that it's, it's hard for people to look at um, raw material and recognize anything except the material that they see. So it's like, oh, Theaster's a found, he's a found artist. <laughs> he's a found artist. Um, when the material is uh, 
more complicated when it's a body of knowledge, when it's a, it's a discarded part of culture. Um, how one, like, it may be that I'm caring for a piece of wood and I'm caring for a magazine with the same care that I'm thinking about the material in relationship to its uh, damage and I'm thinking about my skills and the skills of other and others and how we might respond to that. Um, but dealing with the body of knowledge, like old magazines that, that represent the most important visual canon in the world of the black experience. Um, it gives people an opportunity to see another kind of up unpacking and, and the signifier is completely different from um, that. And so I would say to Lunda Johnson Rice and Desiree Rogers, these are very important magazines. I know there's a lot of them, but, but they're really important. But Linda and Desiree had to get out of their building because they had sold the building. And so they were giving things to Clark Atlanta. They were giving things to Har uh, Howard. They were auctioning things. They were deaccessioning. And then they were keeping things that they knew had value, a particular kind of value. But even Linda and Desiree didn't have access to the, the um, levers of um, amplification of their material wealth. They didn't have the Schomburg in Chicago. They didn't, they didn't have folk on their team internally that could say, no, 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 no. Whether, you know, this is worth the money to store them properly in uh, so and so and so. And so part of this work is about not just caring for things, like, you know, this kind of care, like the care, like to restore one magazine was $600 because the Cab Calloway was so nice. It was beautiful, tattered thing. And I just wanted to see what it would cost. What do libraries pay? What would it cost to really care for blackness, to really care, care at the highest level to ensure that this thing had a future? And um, th that care costs, right? But there are folk in the world who understand the value of that care. But for one to mine for the people who understand the value of the care requires another corporation, another 501c3, another kind of understanding of, of bodies of knowledge. And so I think that in some ways, the practice, my, the practice now doesn't have the burden of art or no art or is this, it's more like, can I believe hard enough that these 25,000 magazines and these eight tons of bound magazines and these 18,000 books have the right to live again? And can they be platformed in a way that they've never been platformed? And if that costs $10 million to buy the building, to restore the building, to restore the books, to create the foundation, to create the endowment, 20 million, to, then at what point does it stop being art and move into another genre of meaning making. So I think that the capacity to make meaning may keep the thing in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a gallery and you, you get, you know, this. Um, and I can say to Linda and Desiree, Linda and Desiree, we want to sell this fire truck and a portion of these books um, for $2 million at White Cube. And that'll give me the first million dollars that I need to pay for the restoration of a permanent space. And so the, the leveraging is both kind of literal leveraging uh, uh, and, and poetic leveraging, but, but all, at least in this, all expressing a kind of care that's not just like I sanded the wood all day. Um, it is that I did clean the books. We did hire an arch archivist. We did sand the wood all day, but we were also saying to the lumberjack, yo dog, you may want to keep that tree standing or this wood that you are scrapping 
using as wood chips is really important wood. You know, it could be doing all these other things. And so I think that, that when, you, when you're mining, it's important not that you just take, but you're also like sharing meaning, not making meaning and sharing meaning. And so the whole Ebony crew came to London, saw the show, and they just never saw their stuff in a big, you know, the library was dim and, you know, so they were quite excited to see um, the meaning making that could happen both in this form and then there was another, we, we actually built a library. <laughs> Sydney? That's fine. Um, oftentimes you incorporate performance as we saw tonight and other collaborative efforts. What is it about the presence of a body or the utterance of a voice or the sound of an instrument that you find really fuels your work? Mm. Yeah, the, 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 body, the body came before stand-ins for my body. That um, if one is to experience ecstasy, one needs the body. And I'm not interested in a stand-in for my ecstasy. And I'm not interested in sharing ecstasy via a work of art necessarily. Um, uh, there are other experiences that I need uh, in order for this work to have meaning because I'm actually tired of giving lectures. I, I, and so for this to have meaning for me and not just be like some kind of exercise for a group of students, then I'm, I'm finding that I have to include myself and, and figure out ways to be both audience and deliverer of things. And that's, that's church, you know, that's church. And so, and since church in this, in this way, since ecstasy, if I were to try to describe in a meta way what church is, it's the, it's the pursuit of meaning and the, the pursuit of rightness and and the strengthening that comes as a result of um, believing in something um, that I I want to I want to be engaged in that activity all the time of getting stronger at believing in things that seem impossible right so that so that the meaning making that's happening becomes more and more ridiculous when people hear it on the front end, like, oh my God, the Esther, you'll never do that. That, you know, that, that, that's when it gets really good, you know, when it's like, oh yeah. And it just happens that my belief muscle is just a little bit bigger than other people's. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, in some ways, like with the black monks, um, I just didn't want to go to museums by myself, I, and I didn't. I didn't want the. I didn't want the object. I didn't have the burden. I don't have a modernist ver burden like that. The object is the only thing that has meaning, making potential for me. That I, I want to actually. I want to ignite that fire truck, you know, with the Holy Ghost. Right. I wanna. I wanna. Um, I wanna sing my version of protest songs or anti-protest songs or leveraging songs instead of labor songs. And, and that, and that uh, I'm, I'm trying so hard that one is in a, a flux or an enhancement for the other, but they're just, the, the, it's the full story. So, Performance, in a way, is um, one of the two and a half tricks. And so I try to do it pretty good. Emily? So you've mentioned feeling a sense of obligation to the spaces you work on. And you often employ the notion of social sculpture in order to accomplish these things. And so what I'm wondering is if social sculpture wasn't accepted as a form of art and with you having this sense of obligation, 
would, do you think there would be another platform from which you could accomplish these things? Mm. Or do you feel as if art offers a unique platform? Mm. Mm. So, um, so I'm a potter. And for 13 years, the platform that I made meaning from had no meaning to the, the amplified art platform. And I didn't have the burden of wanting to be a part of the contemporary art world because I wasn't trained to imagine that my only road for fulfillment would happen via the contemporary art world. I, I don't have an MFA or a BFA. I was trained as an urban planner who really I got good at making pots, and so I became a potter because that's what I was good at. Um, I don't know how accepted social sculpture is. I know, I know that the practice that I'm doing seems to others like it is an innovation or it's part of some contingency, but I think maybe Joseph Boys was also a Virgo. Maybe he was, he also had the burden of creating a new political or creating meaning in that way that um, Virgos have God complexes, you know? Kind of like, you know, it's like, God, I have to do everything. I have to do everything all the time. I got to do everything. God, why do you make me do everything for everybody? Um, but what seems to have happened was in this moment where a part of the art world was fishing for a next innovation or a next monkey or a next fetishized hero or a next you know, mule that I offered myself up happily in my practice and I talked about it and I went to all these places and I gave these talks and I would act like a buffoon and I would hide under the rug. I would sing my songs. And so I, I think that in a way, um, what, what feels awesome, what feels awesome and sincerely awesome is that there was a moment where the, um, the regime, the, the set of things that I have interest in, well, the regime, which is like, all right, there's this landscape of contemporary art and it's, and it's riffing on all these things and I know what those things are and um, what I'm interested in is like right here you know, and that the place in the middle had, I think that, that that part in the middle between what the regime is and where I am, that's when hustle and pimp shit and survival and um, all of the years of double consciousness and um, having multiple tongues and having to figure out the kind of adaptive radiation survival shit that people have to do like me. It was like, oh, that's when uh, a knowledge of how systems work and how structures work, how structures have gaps, loopholes. That, that's when, um, that's, how, that's how people survive. And so it was like, oh, this contemporary art world doesn't know what its next move is. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and, and some of that is theatricality and um, some of that is belief and um, some of it's just how hard are you willing to hustle to um, make the regime believe that you're the next part of 
the continuum of the regime. And not everybody's invested in convincing the regime that they, what they do is next. It just depends on how arrogant you are and how, you know, it's really, it's really uh, that when I'm really quiet, I've come to believe that I should win the race. I want to win. I'm dead serious. And I want to win until I don't want to play anymore. And we don't always have the luxury of winning. We don't always have the luxury of playing. We don't always have the luxury of determining when we won't race anymore. Some of us bust our knees, you know. We have a bad show. We fuck a 17 year old. We get caught up on uh, cocaine charges. All those things most deaf talks about. <laughs> I mean, really, we could just listen to most deaf and be like, oh, if I don't do that, if I don't do that, I don't do that. <laughs> Hennessy is running this game shit. I love that, I love most dog. Whoa. Moto, moto, moto. Moto still, moto still. Um, Wilmer. Theaster, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about politics. Okay. Um, your practice seems to extend beyond the industry of the art, art world, if you want to call it that, and um, into industry of politics almost. Um, you mentioned a little while ago that it wasn't until recently that you had access per se or like an access point into an industry of politics. And so I wonder um, if you've started to conceive your projects in like an overtly partisan way. Mm. And also um, if, you know, a political climate, be it local or regional, has affected the manifestation of your projects in the past. Mm. Great. Right on. So uh, I actually don't imagine myself as being political, uh, even though politics are necessary. And I don't, like, I don't imagine myself as being religious, even though I carry the Holy Ghost. Like, I roll, like, it's like, yeah, I could be speaking in tongues right now. Anything might happen. Anything could happen. I'm not gonna. Um, but I, I, I think that there's a way in which if we, once we decide um, at what level we want to make meaning, right? Like we can either choose to make meaning through our paintings and that the, that the, that the, that the history of painting is the, is the goal of the meaning making or the political or the things that we believe in, whatever they are, become the thing that we embed in the painting. And the painting is the vehicle by which we express our our engagement with meaning, the political, the religious, what the, my sexuality or my whatever. I, but I think that the, now for me right now, the canvas, the, the vehicle is completely blown open. It's expanded. There's, there's no particular vehicle. So it's like, well, I just want to make meaning. And I want to make meaning, um, like I want to ask urban plan, since I'm a planner, I want to, I want to show urban planning its failures. I want to, I want to take on the, the discipline of urban planning. And so um, I'm doing that by tackling black space and blight. And I'm doing, and I'm tackling it not, not just with the tactics of urban planning, but actually by saying that what you call blight is actually um, maybe desacralized space. And I have the capacity to make space sacred. It, th that in fact, when we're talking about a raised building or an empty lot, we're actually just talking about land. If we, if we remove the connotations, the, the, the evil, the, the, the connotations that the devil puts on our places, reload that! 
and that maybe sometimes it's, it's important to have another modality besides the modality given to talk about space so that you have like a lens by which you could tackle the existing modalities. So, so I think in that way, um, the political, because, because there's no way of escaping God and sex and the political uh, in meaning making, I do feel like I can't talk about civil rights. Like I can't talk about, I can't talk about why my neighborhood's blighted without talking about why Jews moved from South Shore in Chicago to Winnetka. I can't talk about that move uh, when blacks and Jews rolled together solid. Um, it created civil liberty. It created new liberty for us both, which meant that Winnetka on the, on the North Shore became available and where it had been all wasp, now there were these openings, these gaps, it's awesome. So then it meant that these amazing mansions on the South Side were available. And where black people couldn't cross to the uh, East Side of Stony Island, then they could. Um, but every time I say black or white or wasp or Jew, there's this kind of anxiety. You know, but but it's hard to talk about space migration and people migration without calling it what it was that that particular people, not just particular people. Synagogues got built on the North Shore. New schools were developed. People moved there. Flow like they, they there was flight. They flew there. Right. Created opportunity for black folk who were doing really well in a poor neighborhood to then decide if they want to stay among their people or create a new conservative black majority where the Jews used to live. That would also mean that blacks who were doing a little less better could then buy those houses from the blacks that were now where the Jews were, who were now where the wasps were, right? And we got to a point where nobody wanted to live on the bottom anymore, right? Detroit. We, and so no one cared for the bottom, right? And, and I think that, that uh, civil rights was the beginning of the black middle class having the ability to no longer care for its brothers and sisters in the same family, its brothers and sisters who chose not to go to college who became the crackhead, that, that, that there is a rift, rift between even in, 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 in our families. And so it's like, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't make without talking about politics. I, I can't make without talking about God and I can't talk without talking about sex. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Theaster, and thank you for uh, being here tonight. to Fresh Talk Live with the Aster Gates. Read more about the Aster and hear other podcasts in this series on freshartinternational.com.